The medics and the members of the South African police were also on the scene. Uh, the body could not be located. They called out for air support, and I got into this Robinson 44 helicopter with a uh, crew, and we eventually uh, located the scene, uh, recovered the body, loaded it into the rear of this helicopter, and flew it back to the headquarters. That's absolutely incredible. You know, this morning we were talking to uh, disaster management teams and talking about how stretched they are. I mean, I imagine that would have been, uh, I think, I can't say a sense of relief, but I guess a sense of, of closure and uh, the assistance that the family would have wanted, especially if this, if this victim was there for that long. Yes, it was very emotional. The uh, family uh, saw the body for the first time uh, at the helipad when it was offloaded the helicopter, and they were, they were extremely emotional. Paramedics actually had to treat them for, for shock as well. All right, Dessen, we have been hearing you. Have got. We've got two back. Reports of missing persons located in the vehicle. Uh, reaction officers in the South African Police Service are currently on scene. Uh, where two cars have been uh, found uh, in a river filled with water and sand. Uh, yeah. They expect the bodies to be inside those vehicles because the drivers have not been located. So the sniffer dogs have been called out and they're currently on scene there sure. uh, as, as to establish whether there are bodies in that vehicle. Oh, thank you very much. That was Prem uh, Balram, sorry. He was talking to us about the recoveries earlier today. That's, uh, that's been the nature of what these teams have been dealing with at the moment. It's been very difficult, especially with the families, some of them not knowing where their loved ones are. And this is what, what they have been uh, dealing with. They now have turned to, to these uh, officials and these teams to try to bring them yeah. the closure that they want. So it's a horrible, horrible situation. And that's why those numbers are continuing to rise. Yeah, it is absolutely tragic. And and we're seeing on the ground people are still digging to try and recover uh, the bodies of those who've perished in these devastating floods. Um, while we still have you in the chopper, Desson, you know, you've been in the chopper for the last few days. Um, I would imagine that is our best option for getting a, a fuller understanding of what these floods have done to this particular region around Durban. We know, of course, that it's, it's further spread than Durban and surrounds. But if you could tell us from your perspective what you're seeing in terms of opening up roads again, mopping up operations, and where there's still areas of extreme damage and destruction. So, you know, I've seen, uh, I've really been seeing a change over the past few days. In fact, initially we would have, we saw the devastation for what it was, and I think it was an eye-opener for so many of us. And as we saw these roads starting to slowly open, and as uh, some of the, some of the life really started to return to normal, we also noticed how there was a severe shortage of resources. I, I mean, some communities had to then start doing that on their own. They had to band together and try to clear debris. We had police that were uh, spending hours on, on one particular uh, incident because they had to, the access was a problem. So although on the one hand we, we, we see progress and it's very slow, remember it's going to take a long while. The latest update by the municipality saying that they are still working on these electricity outages, they are still working on restoring water. And that right now is, is really become the priority of trying to get that very basic need sorted out for communities. Other communities, as we speak tonight, Sally, they are disconnected from other parts of their, of, of their neighborhoods. They completely cut off their vehicles, can't drive through those roads. So that kind of stuff, I feel, I think as we, you know, as we wrap the day today, I think for me, I, I just wonder how long it will be before that returns to normal because that's not something that can be done overnight. And even though resources are coming in, that's really going to take possibly months. I, I'll just give you an example. You know, through the previous storms, there was an area uh, around Chatsworth, and a road was washed away there. And I remember going there almost a year later, and that road was still washed away. So now with the, with the, with the new damage that we are seeing, um, I think it's, it's going to take a long time before there's any sense of normalcy that returns here. You know, Desen, we're on the eve of the Easter weekend, and normally the Easter weekend is a time for family, for celebration, uh, for taking uh, a, a bit of a break. Uh, sadly, um, it's, it's certainly in KwaZulu-Natal, it's, it's mourning, it's grieving. We're seeing increasingly anger over lack of support, as you mentioned, that protest. What do you think this yeah. Easter weekend is going to be like in and around Etiquini? I think it's going to be a very somber one, Sally. Uh, I think I get that sense already. There's a lot of frustration, and based on what we are seeing, I think there's also 
going to be a lot more of these protests popping up. That's that's the sense that we are getting on the ground as well. That's what what people are saying. So right now it doesn't feel like Easter weekend. And I say that from the perspective of living here and being a citizen here as well. It really doesn't feel like that. It really now just feels like a very strange time. It all feels surreal. When we fly above this kind of damage and this kind of devastation, it really brings it home. I'm showing you some of it now. This, there's no way that anyone can be happy or anyone can celebrate at this time. In fact, it, it, it's really just, it's painful to watch. So I think it's going to be a very different one. I think it's going to be an Easter that we're going to remember for all the wrong reasons. So, and I honestly think that uh, there will probably be a, a very few people that would be even interested in coming to Durban during a time like this. I mean, so to, to put it bluntly, you wouldn't be able to offer one of your guests a glass of water from the tap if they came to see you this Easter weekend, it seems. Absolutely tragic. Uh, and the images that are staying with us, Desson, are... Um, the devastation to the informal settlements and the poorest of the poor are always the hardest hit. We've also seen devastation though in prime tourism areas. I'm thinking of that block of flats where the mudslide just came through it. Uh, what is happening in those areas, areas such as yeah. Umfloti, where they're actually um, prime tourism areas are starting to improve things and just talk us through exactly which part of Durban you're flying over as you do that. So we, we're now in Verulam, Sally. So this, in fact, this road was where I spoke to you from the other night. We had a conversation here late at night, and I was yes. talking to you about this road being disconnected. There's a, there's a gaping hole in it. But to go back to your original question, you, you asked about the comparison, and it's an interesting one because the, the, the certain communities, like if you look at Amploti and other communities, there seems to be, uh, there are more resources that are more easily available to those communities, resources that they're able to almost bring together on their own from, from private entities. And there isn't as much of a reliance on government to make sure that, they, that their roads are cleared or that their homes are, are sorted out and so on. But whereas in the informal settlements, you see that there's a stronger reliance on government. On, and that's why there's also that kind of anger, because it's a situation of who do we turn to? We can't be bold here, we don't have a home, we don't have ID documents. Um, some, in some cases, some of them are saying that uh, they don't even have the temporary shelter. So there's a lot going on, and it's a, it's, a, it's a reminder again of the economic divide that we face. So although everyone was equally traumatized, I think the recovery will be a lot quicker in areas, as you mentioned, like Oploti. When I say recovery, I mean the recovery for, for those people who, whose units were not completely destroyed, maybe those that were just flooded and so on. But, but there, are, there will be more permanent reminders there, like that sinkhole that you, I think, uh, which will be etched in our minds forever. Two of them that we saw there as we flew over. It's those images that we'll, we'll never forget. And I think uh, right now, Sal, as I'm showing you this, look at this uh, low-level bridge as well. Uh, you can see how close it is to the water and just the type of pollution that we're seeing in the water as well. That's another conversation as well, Sal. You'll see down here, there's a vehicle still, still trapped in this river down here. You can probably just see the top yeah. of it now. There are a few cars lying off to the side. Uh, you know, these are, these are the types of, of, of scenes that we've almost, I can't say gotten accustomed to, but these are the types of scenes that have now, uh, we, we have to call, almost normalize. You drive past and you see a car upside down in a river or like this, completely trashed. It's, it's, it's completely, it's, it's a real cell. And coming back to what I was saying, even the water supplies are at risk. Yeah. Remember, they, they are, there's the contamination in the, at the beach, in the ocean. We've received warnings about that, about swimming. So questions will arise about how long will that take to, to be sorted out as well. Desen, you mentioned the protest earlier. I want to I want to get a sense from you on how how seriously that is going to be taken. I'm wondering if that could become a real powder keg. You know, we're not that far off from the July looting, and we have had sporadic reports of looting, I think, over the past few days. Yeah. Um, just how high do you think that risk is at this point? Or are authorities starting to respond to those areas and those people who feel abandoned? Not necessarily, not necessarily Sal, and I don't think it's a case of not wanting to respond. It's just that there are so many areas that they need to attend to. So every one of them feels that their area needs to be prioritized beyond any other, understandably so, because of what they're going through. 
But right now, these communities are also well aware that it is the time to raise all of the concerns that they would have wanted to raise previously about housing and about any other issue about electricity or water or anything like that. And as a result of that, that's why these protests are popping up and these, uh, these concerns are being raised. You spoke about looting, Sal. We, we know that last night there were two areas in Amlazi that, we, that uh, they were looted, there were incidents of looting at. And there, 12 people were arrested as well for that. And, and, as, a, and as a result of that, um, you know, it's really now shone the, the, the spotlight on that element. There are so many things wrong. There are so many different elements and so many things that, uh, that government has to deal with that it just seems like they can't possibly have their finger on the pulse on all of these different issues. Sal, I have lost my, my connection with you in my ear, but I will continue to bring you these visuals as we fly over on our way back to base shortly. Absolutely majestic, actually, what we are looking at. And, um, Desen, I'm, I'm not sure if the connection has uh, been re-established, but um, I wanted to speak to you about the the likelihood, the very strong likelihood of more rain in this area over the weekend. The weather forecast, I think, is saying at least a 90% chance of rain uh, in Durban on Saturday at least. We know that the water has absolutely soaked through all the ground and there is still a significant risk of mudslides. Um, okay, Desen, um, can you hear us? I'm going to... All right, I think we've lost our connection with Desen, but he seemed to be suggesting that was Hazelmere to yeah. him, uh, which, of course, is expressing a lot of water at this point. So um, it's, it's actually quite an incredible contrast, Shahan, isn't it? Because they're exquisitely beautiful visuals. Yeah, it is. And obviously the reality is it might look beautiful to us here in Johannesburg, but people are really struggling. And as Sipa Madla was showing us earlier, they're yeah. trying to pick up the pieces, try to dig in and search for whatever they've lost.